So part of what I wanted to mention today, because you've heard me so many times in the past talk about um, Aya Santusica, whose um, little hermitage is outside of Santa Cruz in the California mountains. And um, it's always just been big enough for these two nuns and they've been building a little, their, a building has been built, a little kuti for guest visitors and there's always projects going on on the property for various and a sundry maintenance things and um, she and the other sister that lives there, Aya um, uh, Chitananda, do various retreats and they just finished their rains retreat, which I think is generally at least a month, maybe two months of taking time to themselves. And so she wasn't teaching and I went on her website and I noticed that now she's teaching again with a fervor. So she did a weekend uh, as an invitation from the Bellingham um, Insight Meditation Group in Washington on dissolving the sense of self. And one of the things I really like about her is her approach to the suttas because she's a very down to earth person. She was a householder, a married woman, two children, grew up in the Midwest in Indiana and um, found uh, the Dharma when she was later in life, like four, in her forties. And interestingly enough, she found it because her son went on a quest and uh, decided to become a monk. And she went to visit her son's monastery um, and really got involved and interested in it. And, you know, it's all history from there. But sometimes she does uh, like a focus like we've talked about before, and we're going to delve into a little more on Tuesdays on the um, Anapanasati Sutta, the foundations of breathing, the breathing practices. And she went through quite a few different discourses, small ones, on uh, in this in this two days. Uh, uh, it's like an hour and a half in the morning and an hour and a half in the afternoon, and the format's usually the same, where there's a Dharma. Uh, discussion that she will have on a sutta and then there's questions and answers and this particular weekend was on giving up identity giving up our, our view of self um, and some of the suttas in the morning were short and some of them in the afternoon were a little bit longer um, but one of the I thought I thought I would mention one of the suttas, and then uh, if I can, I I managed to um, record a little bit some of the questions and answers, and I was one of the people asking a question uh, on the agitated mind, because um, usually those of you who know me uh, know my practice know that if most of the time. Once I actually sit still and try to meditate, I go to sleep. So I'm generally dealing with uh, sloth and torpor. And uh, lately, sloth and torpor hasn't been so predominant because agitation has been. So, you know, instead I have this criticalness, a kind of... Um, judgment that I have about everything about myself and people around me. And it's like, sometimes I think, where did the Dharma go? The, I mean, it's such a, a shining example of how we can't really control our thoughts, uh, but we can be aware of them. And I'm constantly aware of um, this nagging kind of criticism uh, aversion, a certain aversion, just that I will notice the first thing. I used to be a lot more greedy. I would notice, you know, something that I wanted to have more instead of a criticism about something, you know, going on around me. 
Um, and you also know I'm, I'm working with um, right speech and trying to be kinder in my speaking, especially in those close to me, um, which oftentimes means remaining more silent and giving another person more space and, you know, being a little less um, immediately putting out my opinion, which I have plenty of opinions. <laughs> And, you know, having mindfulness and awareness in the background, like Ajahn, uh, um, like Utejaniya, Sayada Utejaniya was just mentioning in that quote that I read, that even being aware of something that's, you know, aversive or difficult um, is a skillful means. It's, it's a skillful direction of leaning the mind toward being aware of this. Of course, what happens is the second thing that comes along is my judgment that I'm doing this, that I'm feeling critical or, you know, so first there's the, the, the awareness, that's great. And then there's the common storyline about the second arrow. You know, the second thought that comes around is, oh, there you go, being critical again. Well, I've gotten a lot better at letting go of, of that. Um, but so many different things come in, like I'll notice, uh, I wish I could think of something immediate right now. Oh yeah, sure, it just happened a couple of hours ago. <laughs> Where uh, uh, my partner was writing a really nice description about his latest um, uh, assembly piece of beautiful glass, glass and recycled uh, glassware, candle holders and things like that salt and pepper shakers, etc., collected from Goodwill and LED lights that go into them. And anyway, he was, he was writing a little description for a press release. And I just have such an immediate response of, well, I don't think, you know, that's way too many words. The, this is too much for a press release. I don't think they'll look at two videos and all these pictures. It just needs to be a little description. All of this is sort of going in my mind. And because of the practice and because of, you know, mindfulness arising, at least, I can see that that's almost going to be the first thing out of my mouth. And by bringing mindfulness and by bringing awareness to, you know, what it is that's happening in the mind, and in this case, it's criticism arising, um, so noticing that becomes that first moment of, oh, okay, an, a moment of awakening to a habit of the mind that is really, really ingrained. You know, it probably has come with me for many lifetimes, um, but I'm acknowledging it and I'm beginning to slightly change my behavior around expressing it or even trying to back up in terms of not going off on too many thought forms around expressing it inside my mind so that it doesn't create for me, um, you know, so it doesn't create for me so much more suffering. So we have a new person joining us. Hi, Lorraine. I'm in the middle of uh, talking about agitation in the mind. Uh, welcome. Um, so, you know, there are these, well, we, you know, we know about the five aggregates of form and feeling and perceptions and thoughts and mental con contact and, you know, it's contact that causes the feeling and it's contact that makes the perception and the mental activity and our choices are sort of possible in there to not follow through on the activity on the activity of blurting out the words, maybe even on the activity of thinking further about it. Um, and one of the uh, comments that she, well, it, yeah, one of the comments that she mentioned to me was, you know, maybe you can just step back a little bit from it. Just step back and see, is there any space around all of this? Um, because there's this identity view that I'm, you know, clinging on to this definition of this kind of conceit around who I am. 
uh, and you know that's not really who I am. I'm just these conglomerate of the five aggregates coming together, uh, expressing um, this form, these thoughts, this mental activity. Um, let's see if there's a short. Uh, a short sutta here around it, but there might not be. Well, actually, giving up view of self. It's uh, in the link in the linked discourses. It's number thirty-five, and this is verse one sixty-seven. Then a mendicant went up to the Buddha and said to him, "Sir, how does one know and see that view of self is given up?" Mendicant, knowing and seeing the eye, sights, eye consciousness, and the eye contact as not self, view of self is given up. And also knowing and seeing the pleasant, painful, and neutral feelings that arises, conditioned by the mind, contact as not self, view of self is given up. And so just vaguely even noticing from time to time that I have this attached view of, of self and to sort of give up that view of myself, that my opinions are always the right ones or that I even need to express my opinions, especially if they're critical or maybe I don't even have to think of them for very long, you know, to let go so that there's some freedom and some space um, around, you know, me not attaching myself to, uh, the belief that all of these thoughts should be clung to. So I'm just going to see if I can find, um, some of these questions and answers, and I'm going to try to play them and I'll see if I can uh, Some source. You can at least uh, hear it on the screen. Because uh, I think you'll hear her answer to my question. I just have to see where I actually put it. Yeah, I asked about agitation of the mind. I might fast forward through some things. I don't know how long this is, but... So I was asking about agitation and she was talking a little bit about it. And then someone else um, brought up something about grief. And it was a very unusual topic that she chose as grief. And the answer that Aya gave her was a, was a very broad answer because she was talking about, she had moved from not the Carmel area, but maybe the uh, Santa Barbara area, I think. and loved the coastline there and now she's moved up to uh, maybe Salt Spring Island or some somewhere colder with not as interesting coastline and she had this attachment to where she lived and she was grieving not being able to go to that coastline and yet she was appreciative of the people in the Dharma Center there in Bellingham which was where she moved to so uh, if I fast forward through this, I will, but let's first, let's see if you can hear it. See if it plays. So, is it possible to can you hear that? recognize a different perspective to come from? Um, sometimes the way I think of that in myself is I s step back. It's like the the agitation of the mind, all the things you described. It's like it's right in front of our face, you know, we're just buried in it. <laughs> well, what happens if we step back? Is it possible to step back and see more space around it? that there's something else there besides the agitated mind and the self-criticism and the kind of feeling like I'm not doing enough or I'm not far enough along. I think it kind of goes back to one of the suttas we looked at yesterday where 
you know, Anuruddha's like, okay, I've, I've got, I've, I've got this in my practice, but I'm not there yet. Um, you know, and, and talking about it to see those qualities that, that, you know, conceit and restlessness and, and then when when sorry Pooja says put your mind on the deathless so it's a little bit like what I'm talking about is there a is there some kind of um, grounding ground in the mind some space some place you can step back to to just let that see if you can set that down I think the closest that I get to anything like that is switching to do something else, and that's compassion and loving kindness, which, you know, is a skillful place to put the heart and mind. Uh, and then I just have to not give very much attention to the voice that's basically saying, oh, look, you're just making this stuff up. You're just going along saying these phrases. And I'm still here. <laughs> I wonder if you can go more into feeling and less into the thought. Like feeling what's happening in your body. Yeah. You know. Which is always um, what I tell other people. <laughs> when thoughts come, come back to the body. body. Something happens also in the body. Yeah. Like when we're meditating and we're pretty quiet, then if a thought comes in the Mind, there's some place in the body that tenses up. And I wonder if maybe you can work with this through the body instead. It would definitely be wiser than to continue proliferating thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, go to the feeling and and if you and and being present with that feeling, you know, and but I like the, your idea of bringing in the compassion and the kindness. Um, you know, kind of getting the sense. I mean, you already have the sense. This is like an endless kind of treadmill of anxiety. And, and it's exhausting. Yeah. Which is also no. probably why I fall asleep during my meditation practices. Sure. So... See what it would take to kind of set that down, step out of it, step away. Um, you know, the Buddha taught about, about separating the mind from the body. You know, like when we're going to die, that's going to happen anyway. Um, but in this case, it's kind of like separating the wise part of the mind from all the scripts it's mm -hmm. been given. Mm -hmm. I try yeah. to simplify it sometimes by reminding myself about the Buddha separating thoughts from skill, skillful and unskillful. Mm -hmm. But, you know, then I'm just kind of giving myself these Dharma talks in my mind. It's Actually, getting so full. <laughs> Actually, Dharma talks in the mind can be a real skillful means. Even if, like, Ajahn Chah, um, he, in, the, in Stillness Flowing, his biography, if you look, if you read that. Have you read that? I have it, but I, it is so big. <laughs> yeah, it is, but um, have you started? I have started. Well, if the part you got to isn't interesting, flip back a little bit. But Ajahn Chah would definitely talk to himself, kind of on both sides of a question. Like, he's dealing with some kind of challenge, and he gives himself these Dhamma talks. So if if you're giving yourself a Dhamma talk, um, you know, just... Again, it's trying to do it in a way that actually is inspiring. But, um, but I would say explore this idea of stepping out of those scripts and what that's like. Explore that more. See if you can give yourself more space. Time when the mind really settles. 
stops without any concern about where you might get to or if you should have done anything. Just see if you can all see all of that, like you said, in the category of unwholesome, but you don't have to have so much judgment around it either. Just like, okay, this is tiring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's also very sad. <laughs> yeah. It's got a lot of various emotion, thought, mental, emotional thought patterns connected to it. Yeah. So if you can feel that emotion of feelings that are, that felt sense in the body, mm -hmm. and explore that more. Thank you. So that's probably enough about that for now. But she also went further to suggest that I spend some time in a monastery that going to a monastery for a month really helps a person let go of ingrained patterns in the mind so that there's more time to let them drop away. Of course, that's not always an easy thing for any of us to think or to take out the time to do, but just stepping back from the habit patterns of the mind um, that uh, have have just been so ingrained and to, you know, feeling it in the body instead of going on and on about it in the thought form that's so familiar. So I just thought I'd share that little part. I won't go on with the next person's question around grief, but the one, you know, after listening to the, this other person talk about, I mean, she was really saying that she was grieving the 80s. Like, the California that she was grieving isn't the California that's there anymore either in, in, her, in her mind. And that, um, and Sister uh, Santusica was saying that we can appreciate what we had and then focus on what's here and now. And that we can't really focus on things of the world if we want to be freer. You know, this world is impermanent and it's constantly changing. And that's what we're seeing over and over again. And so, you know, those of us on a Dharma path, um, maybe you've heard the story where somebody, these different people ask the Buddha, um, you know, what if a mountain is coming in from you from the north? Uh, and then it's basically, and the mountain is coming in to you from the east and it's coming into you from the south and it's coming in from you to you from the west where you know where is that where is there to go and basically you know he said that if the mountain is coming from every direction be virtuous and do good things and you know no matter what is clamoring in on our minds if we can do our best to you know um incline the mind toward the skillful, connect in with our body of where we're feeling something, um, and be, you know, have harmonious living as best we can, virtuous, uh, do good things and remember our good deeds. The rest is, you know, always falling apart. Whatever is falling apart is supposed to be happening and it's, things are always falling apart. So we have to kind of realize that constant change. So that's probably enough about me and my agitated mind <laughs> and what happened in my retreat last weekend with Sister Santusica. But if you're interested in, in hearing any more of her writings and readings, and she has a Wednesday Sutta study now that she's back into teaching again. And on Saturdays, there's an hour guided, or there's an hour of meditation and then questions and answers. And it's called, how can I, I think it's called, how can I meditate with this? Which is a really good uh, title for, for a sitting group, I think. How do I, how do I meditate or how do I find mindfulness with this, something like that. I can look it up, but if you want to see any more of her stuff, I'll, I'll turn you in that direction. It's a Karuna uh, KB, Karuna Bhavana. 
is her the name of her monastery. So thank you for listening to me ramble on about this. And now I want to hear what you have to say about it. And I hope that some of this rambling has been of some kind of benefit to you and maybe you can relate to it a little bit somewhere along the line.